Hi everyone, Lisa and Dan here from Fireside Strategic. We're on a mission to help business leaders achieve great results through human-centered strategy. We believe that businesses don't need to choose between investing in their humans and generating profit because it's the humans that create that profit. In the Fireside Chat series, we're showcasing how leaders are transcending the challenges of the COVID-19 crisis and more broadly unite strategic and human thinking and leadership. Today, we're excited to chat with Leah Davidson, COO of Candlewit. Leah, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Please tell ourselves a little bit about you and your story. Sure. So I um, grew up in a small town in Canada, as a, and I didn't have a lot of mentors or um, guidance going through the college application process or starting college. Um, not no one in my family had been to college before, and when and so I applied for scholarships and luckily got admission to Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania, which was a, my dream school. But when I was there, faced a lot of challenges going through the college to career transition. I found that a lot of times um, networking doesn't necessarily come naturally to people with certain personality types. And as an introvert, I struggled making that connection with recruiters and struggling to make myself stand out in networking events. And then when I went through the recruitment process, we had around 50 to 100 um, companies come to campus, maybe more. Um, and so I had back-to-back -back interviews for several months, and that caused a lot of anxiety and depression going through that process and getting rejected over and over again. So I, and then finally, when I landed my, in quotes, job that I thought I really wanted, it was not a great fit for my personality and skill set. And so I wondered, how could we make this process more meritocratic, but also make sure that we're getting the right candidates and the right job fit and not, and reduce some of the anxiety that students are going through, which is now becoming even more severe with the COVID-19 crisis and a lot of companies taking away internship and full-time offers. And so that led me to start CanDoIt, which is an online experiential learning platform that connects students and companies for real world projects. So they can build that relationship with students throughout their college career. So by the time they graduate, both the company and the student have a good idea of what might be a good fit. And they've had exposure to a lot of industries and different fields of work through micro projects, which actually help them fund their education as well, since each project is attached to a scholarship component. And my co-founder comes from 10 to 15 years of industry recruiting and started his own recruitment firm. So he saw the problem from the opposite lens as someone who is looking for entry level candidates sometimes and not being able to find a good fit. And that industry is a $10 billion industry every year of companies trying to recruit top talent, but not necessarily having the right scientifically proven assessment methods to um, get the right people in the right job. And so that's what we're trying to solve in Can Do It is closing some of the equity and diversity gap and um, helping companies and students find a job where the, a job and candidate fit where, where it will truly make them happy and allow both sides to thrive in the workplace. Very, very cool. And I think you're definitely addressing a very real problem. Even from an extrovert's perspective, I remember really struggling with this problem when I was in school too. So love the problem that you're addressing. Curious, you know, you talk about the fact that, and I think you're right, that a lot of interviews don't actually get at what matters most in terms of job candidate fit. You talked about how there's, there's sort of an assessment that's lacking. Are, do you, are you using psychometric tools? Are you measuring personality? What kind of assessment process is Canduit using to help produce better outcomes in terms of job candidate fit? Yeah, so we're developing some proprietary um, predictive analytics tools based on the ONET database, which has um, some occupational competencies and experiences and skills that are necessary for different positions. And we're also scanning entry-level job positions to see what are the prerequisites for those positions and how can we measure how students are closing those skill gaps based on 360-degree feedback that we're capturing throughout the project process. So each project lasts anywhere from one month to six months, and they also get feedback from peers who are maybe collaborating on that project. If it was a professor-led project, they get feedback from the professor and then also from the employer. And so by the time they look for their final job, they will have gone through several micro projects, which give a well-rounded perspective on their skill set, and they can create an experiential portfolio um, and resume on our, on our website, and that is available to different employers. And some employers even allow students to qualify for interviews based on their performance in past projects. So they're actually able to, if it's a good fit, kind of get a, head, uh, a leg up in the interview process. I love that, that holistic approach to hiring and matching. 
Um, would you mind telling us a little bit more? First of all, when was Candlewood founded? And second of all, how, how have the results been? How has it been going? Yeah, it's been going really well. I would say um, we really started working on it starting in 2018. So it's about two and a half years old that we've had the website up and running. Um, we have around 30 university partners. And since COVID, we've had several hundred students joining on a regular basis. Every, every week we've had probably a number of students, like 20 to 30% growth in student week over week. There's been a huge need. And we also have partnered uh, with many different companies for projects. So we've done projects with brands like Uber, Marriott, the NFL, Ashoka, uh, but also smaller startups and nonprofits. And we've done a lot of service learning projects as well. So it's been a wide range, but the feedback has been very positive. I think the employers are being able to reach a more diverse pipeline of students where they otherwise would not have the budget to do campus recruiting. So we're able to actually help reach historically black community colleges, colleges and universities, community colleges, just, um, more gender diverse colleges. So we're able to get a wide range of students in the pipeline who might otherwise not have been on the company's radar and also transcend some of the geographic boundaries since all of our projects happen online as well. Um, and the students have given us good feedback that a lot of times they've been able to learn more about their own passions and interests and also even get in touch with companies that they've later interned or accepted full-time jobs at. That's great. So, you know, it's only been a couple of years and it sounds like you've done so much amazing work so far. Um, have you had a chance to, you know, track some of the outcomes, some of the outputs for the clients that are paying for this service? And if so, how has that shown up? I think initially we're just transitioning now to a talent solution business model where we're charging more on the recruitment side for help with employer branding, um, diverse candidate outreach and then the assessment process. So previously our business model was the charge per project. So a lot of the companies were coming more to do projects and they were more concerned with the project deliverables. And usually that also included idea generation. So we had a lot of companies that were looking at the millennial audience um, and Gen Z and seeing how could they you know, provide more perspectives on digital marketing or reaching a younger demographic. So we had a lot of the idea generation process, brainstorming, and also actually producing tangible out, outputs for social media products. Um, we had some people design strategy for new product launches and also design websites or actually like build out new features or prototypes. So that was a lot of the initial set of projects were actually focused on tangible deliverables that could contribute to the organization and meet their business needs. And now as a phase two, we're looking at how can we help companies recruit top ta and assess top talent? So this is something we're just finding out now and getting some of the initial inputs and outputs, but um, we have gotten positive feedback with companies that have um, designated a set of interns that we will be pulled from that pool and they're able to reach a lot more diverse candidates. So we're able to actually take one project and do it across 10 to 20 different college campuses and provide that feedback back to them about actually meritocratically um, and objectively, where did the best students come from and where did the best work samples come from and make it less biased so they're not necessarily attaching university name or a gender or race to the identifiers, but it's basically purely based on what are the students able to contribute, what ideas do they come up with, and what is the feedback coming from their peers and professor on their work ethic and their communication skills and some of the softer skills that are harder to measure makes so much sense and you, you, you even if you don't know a ton about the recruitment process it's pretty obvious that there's so many things that are done in it that are just done that way because they've always been done that way and so even the choice of university that companies go to the cost of them showing up to do one of those massive on-campus recruitment drives you're saving them a lot of time and money yeah what we noticed is a lot of times for during the recruitment process a lot of the money was invested in you know, swag for the career fairs or wining and dining candidates to try to get them to sign the offer letter and they could actually be investing in the students education and actually investing in their learning process and actually build relationships that are not so um like assessment based at the final stage but they could be more informal and actually get to know each other and actually see maybe it's not a great fit maybe it is but a lot of that neither side really knows until they start building those sometimes mentorship relationships that and they see the progress year over year with a student from the time they enter college to the time they're graduating there's a lot of change that happens 
both in their skill set, but also in how in their self awareness and what they know about themselves. And so being part of that process will help both sides make a good judgment call and actually reduce attrition when students get on the job. I love that. And you know what I find is very interesting. You told us your own personal story about how it was so challenging to find that right fit. And now you are founded a company that's doing so well that is solving for your own personal challenge. I'm curious, how does that feel? Yeah, I, and I think yeah. anyone at my university would say the on-campus rec recruiting process was probably one of the most challenging, um, just emotional periods of their college experience and would mm -hmm. love to make it more streamlined, just the competition they feel competing with their peers, going through rejections, like all of that is a very emotional psychological process that takes a huge toll. And if we can make it less threatening to students, um, I think that would be a huge a huge plus. And also I noticed that it does disproportionately affect students from underprivileged backgrounds. So students who may not have families and members in the careers they want to pursue. And they may not have, you know, the funding for internships or to get or to take unpaid internships or to get certain levels of exposure that their peers do. And just finding mentors in your field to guide you through the interview and resume writing process. Like there's so many disadvantages that certain students face even in that process. And so by I'm making it a little bit easier and more accessible for everyone to get involved. We're also able to remove some of those barriers. Um, and my co-founder and I both come from some of those popula unique population groups. And so we have pretty good empathy for people going through those challenges. And it's been great to see the feedback come in and, and also have employers tell us that they really wanna reach these students and how can we help them um, improve their mandate to improve um, to, re to achieve their goal of improving diversity and inclusion in their organizations. Love that, love that. Earlier on in the conversation, you mentioned that throughout the COVID-19 crisis, more people have been using your service. That's such an interesting, unique phenomenon for a business in general today. Would you mind letting us in a little bit more on how has COVID-19 changed the way that you Losing have to do your business? Agenda, Right. Do you want to ask the question around how COVID-19? Ah. I'm so sorry, guys. Dan, I'm going to ask you to ask more of the questions. Okay. We're going to edit this one. Lee, I'm so sorry about these interruptions. I have all these emotional questions and the internet isn't on my side. All right. Let me try one more time. Um, so Leah, you mentioned earlier on in the conversation that throughout COVID-19, more people are actually using your service. That's such a unique position for a business to be in. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more, how has your business changed because of the COVID-19 crisis and how are you responding as an organization to all of these changes? Yeah, there's been a huge uptick in usage as a result of COVID-19. I think a lot of students have been um, trying, struggling to find internships and work in this period of time. I know a lot of companies have been even taking away offers that were previously accepted for summer work. And obviously career services is trying to make adjustments to get their students in different positions, whether it be for service learning or for credit internships or paid internships. There's many different arrangements that we've seen as colleges try to adapt to this new phenomenon, but also help their students get um, skill development and mentorship and training. We've also seen a lot of our, well, most universities transition to the completely virtual space in a short time period. And we were luckily already set up to accommodate that. So we have a lot of professor-led classrooms that do experiential learning projects during the semester through our platform. And they basically integrate these projects into their curriculum. And so students may do a marketing capstone project and they already, we're doing that through our platform, through our virtual workspace, and it had various online communication collaboration tools for project management. And so we we're already doing a lot of that, but we've had an even higher demand since all classrooms are now virtual and they don't have a lot of those in-person interactions with companies. And this has um, been a huge advantage for us already having the infrastructure set up. We've also made adjustments trying to link students even to external job postings that may have remote offerings 
and provide kind of like a request a project feature so students can come on our platform and let us know what do they want to work on and what industry what length of project and we will almost set up like virtual consultation calls to try to help them like be a virtual career coach and help them find a good fit um, whether it's on our platform or we can reach out to our employer network and let them know where the greatest demand from students is and those are all things that we've done recently in in, in increasing our ability to handle a large volume of requests and we've also you know taken some steps on the company side to waive certain project fees um, to help you know more companies a lot of times students just want experience and sometimes for example california state university told us that their students needed service learning projects and so we were able to find a lot of nonprofits that and charities that had um, business needs that weren't being met by in-person volunteers we were able to transition those volunteer projects to the online space and match them to students who had lost their placements because of you know organizations being closed and not having in-person interactions so now students are able to do teaching and tutoring online and um, they're able to do a lot of their for credit work through our platform as well wow love the fact that you're taking a leadership role in a moment like this and thinking okay if something doesn't work let's find something else that does and also love that you're incorporating professors into the process i think more than they have been previously as someone that's taught a university course there are so many ways and i'm, I'm that i have wanted to help my students more and i've seen the same from other professors they just don't necessarily know how to and when you can incorporate them into this feedback process for, for projects, I think it's a tremendously important way that professors can derive satisfaction, not just from teaching, but from helping students really grow their careers. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen a lot, like for example, with some of the universities in my hometown and colleges, they're trying to link students with local organizations. So also building the local community ties and improving youth retention. So there's so many different, but other universities, you've also seen it the opposite. So the students are working with international organizations and getting a global perspective. Um, so there's many different ways that it can work, but I think the experiential learning is something that a lot of professors have emphasized as being an important goal they're hoping to achieve in the new year, especially with COVID happening and so many students trying to find alternative ways to get that experience. Perfect. Yes. So speaking of learning, I think we've gotten some great learnings for our audience of CEOs on sort of how you've managed the external side of the company, managing the COVID situation. Curious to learn a little bit more internally about how you're leading at Canduit. Could you tell us a little bit about your, your leadership style and sort of how you're leading the team? Yeah, so we've always been a very open, flexible, small team, and we had a 100% remote work staff even before COVID. So we were already used to using a lot of the online communication tools and staying in touch. But we've tried to be very flexible and very accommodating of people's schedules during this time, knowing that people have different childcare responsibilities and have different um, work schedules and may have emotional needs of fulfilling that they're fulfilling within their families so we've tried to be um keep hours as keep, let everyone set their own schedule depending on what works for them and as long as they're getting their work done we have certain meetings that we'd like people to show up for but um, we're very understanding of people's personal lives and how those the professional and the personal seem to be cl oftentimes colliding during this time and I think that I personally have a very empathetic leadership style that has allowed me to really resonate with the problem we're trying to solve and build a vision around that problem. And so keeping people attached to the to actually the social causes that we're addressing and how important those are in times of crisis also keeps people motivated with our, our vision and willing to go the extra mile for the company. It's so important that people feel that alignment, right? That your people feel in alignment with the mission of the company, that they feel inspired by it. Mm -hmm. And uh, absolutely love, love that answer. So thank you for that. And just as we, we start to, to come to a close with our time here today, Leah, curious, you know, as you think about this, this challenging moment, you know, we, we ask lots of serious questions about business and leadership, but we also like to keep things light here too. And so curious to learn what's been fun for you in a moment like this. You've been in quarantine for a while now. Are, are you keeping things light? And, and if so, how? Yeah, I've been able to pick up some 
hobbies that I haven't looked at for a long time. I've read more books recently than I have previously, started blogging and journaling, taking walks outside. And I like the fact that now that we are not, you know, in an office space, we can break up our day. If the weather is nice, take 20 minutes, 30 minutes, go for a walk around the neighborhood and just get a breather. And I think Sometimes like when you're working really hard, you barely even see the sunlight because you're just, you go into the work and then you come out. And so being able to be more connected to nature and also self-reflect on what my goals are personally, not just professionally and how, and what the next few years would look like. But um, also being cognizant now, I think more than ever that there is so much uncertainty and no matter how much you try to plan for it, really valuing the relationships that you're building and it really reinforces what truly matters in life and what you truly find happiness in. And that's not always um, just work. Yeah. And it's, it's so interesting as we've been interviewing C-suite folks and now you know, interviewed 25 people. One of the common themes in terms of silver linings that's come up is us all getting back in touch with our humanity. And it's so easy in business to lose sight of it. It's so easy to be focused on metrics and numbers and growth and efficiency. And yet, there are humans that are the most important feature of any business, right? We're all humans. And so even if at times the numbers can take a greater place in our consciousness, at any moment we can get back in touch with our humanity again. And this moment has been a powerful force for getting a lot of people, I speak for myself definitely, back in touch with, with my humanity. Definitely. Cool. Well, listen, Leah, thank you again for joining us learned a ton from you really really appreciated this this conversation absolutely love the mission of the company and so grateful that that candidate is around and, and growing and so grateful that it's doing well despite all of the, the chaos around us so well done thank you thank you so much for having me thank you